subside on its own terms. All right. So um, if you sign, if you if you signed up for a seat and didn't get one, sorry, your fellow students are criminal are criminals. Okay. Uh, roughly twenty of them. Okay. Just so you know. So I don't know who they are, um, but yeah. So seats are full. Um, all right. Cool. So if you want to uh, still come to lecture and have a seat also uh, at 4 p.m. in Sibley Auditorium, feel free to come by. So I'm going to get going with today's lecture. And uh, how are we doing online? We doing good? Okay, audio is cutting out for you. Good. All right, it'll probably be better once there's less chatting. All right, team, let's do it. So uh, let's get started with data structures. This is the first minute of the first... Uh, Day of the first 61B you've taken, probably. Welcome all. I think this is a pretty cool class and what a moment. So uh, take it in. It's going to be a long, fun, transformative, and intense ride for most of you. So let me tell you a little bit about this class and I'll learn a little about you. Uh, so, what is this class all about? Well, you've already taken programming before. And in those classes you may have taken in the past, you learned how to write programs you could do in theory anything. In this class, what we're going to do that's different is we're going to learn how to write code that is better. Uh, it's better, first of all, because it runs more efficiently. We're going to learn how to write code that uh, executes quickly, that doesn't use as much space, and that's through the judicious use of good algorithms and data structures. And we're also going to teach you how to be more efficient humans, because after all, it's actually not really machine time and fast code that matters. It's writing good code. The bottleneck for any organization is really the humans who build software. So I want to make you better. So to do this, we're going to learn how to design, build, test, and debug large programs. In theory, you already kind of know how to do this, so we're just going to give you new practices to do this. One of the big parts of that is real programming tools. So we're going to be using Git. We're going to be using a tool called IntelliJ, where you'll write your code instead of VS Code or whatever else. Sorry. Uh, JUnit, which is a testing tool uh, framework, and also some command line tools that will come up. We'll also learn Java. And Java, it's a pretty popular language, roughly second or third most popular across the universe. And um, the thing I like about Java is that it's a statically typed language that really forces you to program in a certain way that scales. It's not perfect, but the fact that it's obligate object oriented and the fact that it requires you to specify types all over the place, it is annoying, but it is also a beautiful thing. It constrains your thinking most fundamentally. So we're going to assume that you already have a solid command of the fundamentals of program, and that includes having seen object-oriented programming, you know about recursion, you know about lists, you know about trees, and if all of those things seem roughly familiar, then you should be in good shape. I'll double check the chat to make sure there's no issues. Okay, I'll get to the logistics in a bit. So why study this class? Why is it important? Why did we decide as a faculty that it should be one of the three intro classes? Well, it's clearly very popular. I mean, partially because it's a requirement. So it's clear that just by social pressure, this is a thing to take though. Uh, if we look over time, there was this amazing exponential takeoff that happened at the beginning of the previous decade. Uh, my career at Berkeley kicked off in 2014. Things kept growing and growing and growing. And then we kind of leveled off uh, in part due to supply constraints as opposed to demand constraints. Uh, maybe we'll keep growing. And I think, uh, but this is roughly seems to be steady state for the number of students we have right now. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting that even this semester in fall 2022, we're just having more people come through 61B in a single semester than multiple years combined, just a decade ago. So why is everybody coming to computer science? Well, one of the reasons is that, well, the entire civilization that you live in has been completely reshaped by them, right? So uh, as a very basic text example, I have this, uh, you know, autocomplete thing. So if you go to Google and I do some autocomplete, I go like, uh, you know, how many, okay, right? These are all the how many questions. And it happens instantaneously. Or like, what is up with Berkeley students? Uh, why do Berkeley students, uh, et cetera? Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, will be is, yeah, right, right. So, you know, it, Google has some wisdom about the universe. It knows what to be asking about. Uh, it knows what you might want to say. And that's all based on a data structure that we'll learn in this class towards the end called a try. I don't know what all this stuff. Oh, these are trending searches. Okay, this is just what's popular. Uh, huh. Old Forester birthday bourbon 2022, why? I lived in an apartment we nicknamed Old Forester because we had a bottle of uh, Old Forester that we found that was 20 years old uh, in it. Anyway, um, so anyway, one of the reasons we're curious about this topic of this class 
uh, is because of the fact that, well, all the algorithms that control our lives are driven by them. Seems like a good thing to know about. Another reason is if we think about progress, right? I mean, progress is an uneven thing as a society. We take steps forward, we take steps back in both uh, in the social realm and the technological realm and so forth. And at least at the present moment, we've already done all the cool stuff back in the day, like discovering quantum physics and fertilizer and stuff. And so if you think about how the world is changing right now in terms of the capability of mankind, a lot of it really boils down to computation. So for example, there's AlphaGo, which is a famous Google project uh, where uh, deep learning has allowed all kinds of amazing things to come to pass in the last decade and a half that would have seemed kind of impossible a decade ago, a uh, decade and a half ago. So for example, being beaten at the game Go by a computer, that was something people didn't think would happen. Uh, having to worry about students using AI generated code to cheat in classes, that's a new thing. This is the first semester I've had that in the syllabus, don't do that. Uh, there's other things on the horizon that are gonna be coming through uh, the, this algorithmic advancement of mankind. So self-driving cars, long heralded, yet to arrive. I still think they will eventually arrive and will be a huge deal because there's millions and millions of people who drive for a living. They will not anymore. And there's a million or so people who get killed on a rough, I see how many, I've forgotten the fatality rate, but it's an insane number of people who die every year because humans are terrible drivers. And cars are also terrible drivers now, but they'll eventually get better than us. And as another oops, example, I don't know why that's happening. Okay. Oh, ah, right, this is a video. Uh, this is what I mentioned earlier about the computer generated code. So I'm going to adjust my screen sharing so that it's nice and beautiful for them. Uh, so this is a, a tool someone put together that uses GPT-3, which is a, an AI based text generation tool. And this is something that it's capable of doing that is cool. So here we go. Uh, someone goes and says to this generic language model, looks so ugly, but let's make it bigger. Computer, why are you being slow? You are shy. Well, this is a bad demo. You can't see anything. Ah, okay. Hold on, Zoom. Let's try that. Okay. Is that any better? I don't know what's going on. Okay. I'm afraid. I'm gonna try it one more time. The one bad thing about my laptop is it occasionally becomes very slow and throttles itself to like 500 megahertz. So I suspect that's what's occurring right now. But there's nothing like doing a lecture in front of 800 people to uh, get the, the computer nervous. Okay. How are you doing, computer? Well, I'll do the demo another time so we can get to some content. Let's see. Not still doing okay. All right. Well, you can watch the demo later. It's cool, I promise. Okay. So basically, I'll just give you the, the high level picture of what that tool is all about. You can say, Hey, computer, write for me some code that is a website with a watermelon colored button that says the word potato uh, in Arabic or whatever, and it'll try and come up with it. Or like, uh, make me a website that has three buttons, one shaped like a dog, one shaped like a cat, and one shaped like a fish. And it'll come up with code for you that does that. And that's pretty cool. Another reason that we might consider studying this class other than peer pressure and it drives civilization, maybe you're just narrowly focused on the practice of programming. So data structures, as you'll see when you get to project two, are a really, really important decision to make. The decisions you make about what instance variables to include in your program and how to specify how your classes are defined is going to make the complete difference between an exercise in misery and something that's very natural. I can't really explain it here, but um, one of the creators of Linux, Linus Torvalds, uh, had this to say. So the difference between a bad programmer and a good one is whether the programmer considers code or data structures more important. Bad programmers worry about the code, something about, the, I don't know, let's say the spacing or how cleverly you can fit things on a line or two. Good programmers worry about data structures and their relationships. And I really feel strongly about that. When you try and build something complicated, the data structures are really the most important secret sauce. As I put it at the bottom, being an efficient programmer, both in terms of your time and the computer's time, means using the right data structures and algorithms for what you're trying to do. Another example is uh, if we wanna try and understand the universe. So many of you here may be economists or physicists or social scientists or computational chemists or whatever else. And these days, science is a lot more about things like simulation and complex data analysis. Also all of my data science folks. 
rather than just some simple observations and clean equations. And so here, again, a video that will probably uh, behave poorly, but let's see, that's not the worst. So this is basically a simulation, and I know on Zoom it doesn't look very good, um, where it is a simulation of forming galaxy clusters. And it's hard to say exactly what the equation would be for a galaxy cluster, but what you can do in theory is write a simulation, run it, see if it resembles the universe around you, and if indeed it does, then it tells you something about the processes that help form the universe around us. And it's only possible to write these large scale simulations if you are using the right data structures. So if you wanna keep going beyond 7 billion years since the Big Bang, until maybe you see us in the corner, very small, you can watch the rest. Another thing for those of you who are more theoretical or even full on mathematicians, is that this discipline is actually pretty interesting from a mathematical point of view. Uh, I'm not like a super, I don't know, stereotypically nerdy person, but there's a couple of things that I can do that uh, I can stay up late. I'm, I'm a morning person generally, but I can stay up late uh, either if I'm uh, playing video games. I was just lying. I guess I was lying about being nerdy. If I'm playing video games, I can stay up late. Or two, if I'm writing programs or like slash working on a really interesting math problem. Those are the two things that I like keep me up. Um, that are because like even back in the day when I was younger, didn't have two kids. I would go to parties and I would get sleepy around 1130 or midnight and then I would take a nap at the party for a half hour and I would recharge and be ready to hang out some more. Uh, but somehow the, the math the, like keeps me awake. So if you have that same part of your brain that you find math problems like really, truly compelling, uh, there's some interesting ones in this class. So here is, for example, this house. I don't know if you've seen this puzzle, which is, can you draw this house without picking up your pencil? So like, uh, go boop, 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 ah, nope. Oh, and there's another rule. You can't go back over a line that you already did. So it turns out it is possible to draw this house and uh, it's something you can do after class. Uh, but this is a, a classic problem. It's another version of this classic problem called the seven bridges of Königsberg, uh, which is in this town, is it possible to cross these seven bridges without crossing any twice? And so it turns out that it is impossible. And this was an interesting math problem. And it actually, when we get to graphs in about week seven or eight of this class, uh, we'll, be, we'll, we'll be equipped with the theoretical machinery to solve this kind of problem, though we won't solve this one specifically. And what I'm showing here is this picture of these bridges, this more like Settlers of Catani version picture of those bridges, and this graph, these are all the same object, right? different ways of, of visualizing the same thing. So if that appeals to you, it's another reason to study this class. Even if you don't care about self-driving cars or civilization or humans, maybe you just wanna stay awake so that you can party later. So question for you, like why, what do you wanna be? Why are you here? Like I gave you some reasons why studying this class might be good, but what are, what are some things? Come throw out some thoughts, somebody. Throw up a hand and I'll point at you. You can say something. Go ahead. Prereqs. Prereqs, good, right. It's a requirement for a degree or another class, yeah. What's that? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. What's some other good math problems? If you email me, I'll send you a fun one that I liked last year. That's good. It's funny though, actually, just like full on math problems, I sometimes use them to fall asleep. So it's like a duality. Because otherwise, I think about too many things. But if I think about math problems, sometimes it can help me sleep and stay awake. It's, it's pretty cool. Good job, math. Anyway, email me and I'll send you a good math problem. All right, yeah. Jobs, right. It is absolutely true that it's in a, in a uh, uncertain time. This really is the class that I think opens the door to a profession that's one, fun, keeps you awake or gets you to sleep as you desire, and two, pays pretty well. And if you feel financially precari pre precarious for any reason, it's a great field. It's pretty fun. Uh, it's hard to get totally, completely burned out, in my opinion, so far. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good opening door for a good door to open to go to jobs. I think that's the right metaphor. All right, somebody's not in the front row. Yeah, go ahead, lecture. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, oh, purple. Yeah, research. research, yeah, it helps you do research. So it opens up research opportunities. All right, black shirt, go ahead. They, oh, crush leak code, exactly. Defeat leak code at its own game. I don't know what that means, all right. I'll do, I, one thing I've been meaning to do is I've never used leak code but I went to live stream trying to do it sometime. So uh, I'll do that sometime and I'll let you know. I always like to live stream weird things like once a semester. All right, one more thought. Yeah. Take a class with Josh Hook. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that I you know who I was, but cool. It's a good class to be in if for that purpose. 
I'll probably be teaching it next spring. I was originally going to do CS70 next spring, but I am now the faculty director of the uh, machine learning master's program. So I'm doing that instead. Anyway, one more actually. I lied. I want someone in like this corner. Yeah. Learn Java. Nope. Go ahead. I mean, yes, you will, but that wasn't the person who pointed that. Oh, cool. Yeah. GSI said most useful class. I think this class is extremely useful. That I can say for it. I'm, I feel 100% comfortable saying this class is su supremely useful. Hi, Zoom. I'm going to look at you so you don't feel totally. Uh, there you go. Okay. Bringing balance to the force. Okay. Yes. I assume maybe that the first time I see. Okay, and then um, who are you? So I want to get a sense of who, what your backgrounds are in the room. So Zoom, as you'll note, I'm just doing out loud because I can't really go back and forth, but uh, who here is a freshman? Okay, some number, not a ton. Is this anybody's first class ever at Berkeley? Woo! Cool. <laughs> is this anybody's last lecture at Berkeley ever? I don't know what that would mean, like you're dropping out at 3 p.m. or dying. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, who here is a sophomore? Lots of sophomores. Cool. Who here is a junior? Hi, junior. Who's a senior? Any graduate students in the room? None. Oh, bummer. Well, they usually are allowed to come, but this year we had not let them in, so we didn't have enough money. That's how it goes. Uh, anybody, some other, oh, anybody here? None of those four categories, like you're a, yeah, community person, what's your role in life? Exchange student, cool, hello, exchange. where are you from? Mexico, hello, all right, welcome. Uh, let's see, who has taken uh, 61A? Okay, who has taken 88? Okay, who took CS10? All right, who here has taken a Java class, a class that it contains Java in it before? Okay, how many people have never taken a class that has Java in it before? Okay, that's the more. That's like two thirds no Java, a third Java for those of you on Zoom. Uh, any other demographic questions anybody have? Transfers. Woo! You guys are kind of clustered a little there. Uh, other demographic questions? Say again. Returning students. A few, yeah. Other demographic questions? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, good. Yeah. Oh, I'm not gonna do. My, I'm not gonna go back yet, but I'll take questions about those things right after if you want, but not today. All right, what about us? So in terms of us, so I'm Josh Hug. This is my ninth year at Berkeley. Um, I was an undergrad at UT Austin. Then I was a graduate student at Berkeley where I got my PhD in 2011. I then went to Princeton where I taught for three years. Actually, I always public school. I was public school, like going to school, public undergrad, public grad. Went to Princeton for three years. It was nice, um, but I don't know. I just want to come back here because it was cooler and uh, I missed the ocean. Um, if I could do anything, I would probably spend like, I don't know, uh, I would teach. I would find a way to teach in the, mm, I, I would teach one semester a year and then I would just surf the rest of the year. That'd be kind of my ideal situation. Um, so if any of you get me super rich, that will be the pay price that you pay in the sense that you will be depriving people of a semester of me teaching here, I guess. But because uh, I will be just selfishly hanging out on the beach instead of doing some kind of service and thing. Um, my favorite place to surf is uh, Tongs, uh, which you can Google. Anybody know what Tongs is? No? Yeah? No, it's not the food thing. It's a place. But I used to surf there every single morning and, after and evening. It was great. Um, anyway, uh, but here I am, ninth year. Uh, I really like being here. It's really fun. And I teach data structures. I teach the social implications of computing a lot. I teach the data science class and then a bunch of other stuff. Uh, my office is 779 Soda. I will post my office hours once I figure out when they are. Uh, I have two kids who are two and five. My five-year-old started kindergarten last week. Uh, maybe I'll bring my two-year-old someday. Uh, in terms of GSIs, we have a number of what I call full-time GSIs. These are your TAs who are, in addition to being undergrads, most of them, a uh, few of their are grad students. Uh, they work 20 hour jobs a week. So it's pretty intense. And they're running the show, doing the infrastructure, that sort of thing. And then we have our part-time TAs who are doing eight hour jobs a week. Uh, and they are generally a little 
uh, more junior in terms of uh, being more recently joining the TA staff, not everybody. Some people just don't want to spend 20 hours a week of their life doing teaching. Uh, almost all of the TAs are undergrads. We have a couple of grad students. I think we have two, right? Is that right? Three? Oh, yes, right. Um, so, and that's pretty typical here at Berkeley. Uh, you guys, for those of you who are kind of new, uh, actually, there's only a very small number of freshmen, but uh, I'll mention that there's a lot of undergrad TAs at Berkeley. It's an interesting path that you might be, want to follow sometime. We also will have a large number of academic interns. We'll be around mostly to help with lab and office hours. Uh, and we have about 300 applications so far, and I'll talk about what those are later. Once we're hired. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our class and logistics, and then I'll do some programming. So first thing I wanted to point out uh, is something that I had to learn that maybe all of you know, because you grew up more recently than I, or almost all of you. And um, it's something about the manner in which learning occurs. So I'm going to turn off the sound here because it doesn't really matter. Uh, but this is the game Dance Dance Revolution, which I'm decently okay at. Not as good as the people in here who play, but like I do okay. And so the first time I ever played this game, I roughly had the skill of these uh, couple of guys on the left and had no idea what I was doing. And then this is not me, but I eventually got to, you know, roughly speaking, like this level of skill on the right. Like, I mean, basically. So, and like <laughs> the reason I mentioned that is because this is literally how I learned that practice is how you get good at things. Like I knew people said it, but I never really believed it in my heart, right? I had the sense that like, well, there's some people who just like play the guitar or like they sing well or whatever. And it's true. I do really feel like there is something about learning speed and that different people in different domains learn more quickly than others. But I personally believe that the where you can get in terms of your skills, whether they're intellectual or physical or musical or whatever, you can probably go a lot further than you might have believed otherwise. So the way that you actually learn something is not some like innate, hey, I just knew how to program from the time I was born. It's that you actually put in some practice. Now, incidentally, I did actually start learning to program when I was quite young. So for me, part of the reason that I didn't realize that this is how learning occurs, especially in computer science, is because I started learning it so young, thanks to Ad for buying me a computer when I was single digit age. Um, and there are people in this class who've been programming since they were like seven, right? Not everybody, but there's a small number of them. And they're going to seem to move a lot more quickly than you if you just started last semester or today. Probably you didn't start today, though, because you shouldn't be in this class. So when I say the manner in which learning occurs, um, only a small minority of the actual practice process is from these lectures or from reading. Like my goal is to get you excited about something and to lay the foundation, but you don't really understand anything until you do it. So the vast majority of your learning is going to come from discussion sections or the study guides, which I'll mention, or the theory homeworks we provide. And that'll, that'll make you understand the theoretical concepts in the class. And then when it comes to the actual process of, I wanna build uh, whatever like, um, web tool of some kind or whatever, like whatever program you're trying to build, that comes through actually programming. So that's in this class, labs, coding homeworks, and the projects. And then how do you design a big system? Well, that comes through projects two and three, and we'll talk about those later. So I just really want to put this out there. Super important not to think that some people are just super good at this. Yes, we are at very different levels between each other in this class, and that's just something we have to live with. But you personally, your journey might be more arduous or take longer, but you can actually get really good at this. So in terms of logistics, this is the most boring part of the lecture, but I, it's, it's important. So in terms of how our class actually works, we have a website. Here it is linked. I will buy datastructures.com and I let the domain expire one day. I've been watching it for about seven years. Uh, <laughs> uh, did snipe this one, so that was cool, but you know, it's still a little gimmicky. Uh, we have lectures, discussion, lab, and office hours. Uh, there is an ed discussion forum. We're using this instead of Piazza, and that's the official line at Berkeley. I'm fine with ed. Uh, and we have a little mini textbook with this goofball name that I picked uh, that is basically the lecture content, but in written form. 80% of the words in this textbook were written by former TAs, uh, and it's just out there for you to as a bit. Redu it's redundant with the lectures and the slides, but it's a different format for those of you who prefer it. Unofficially, you're, of course, welcome to go Googling around, looking at Stack Overflow, looking at other programming courses out there, uh, looking at online documentation. And I'll talk a little bit about collaboration policies, but I expect that in the year 2022, yes, of course, you're using the internet to supplement your learning. Now, in terms of uh, waitlisted folks, if you're on the waitlist, we got money to hire seven and a half new TAs. So that allows us to add a lot more slots. So I think we'll get you all in. 
Uh, if you do Project Zero, I will fight tooth and nail to get you in by week four, hopefully a lot sooner than that. Uh, I think we're going to be able to take everyone. I can't promise. If you are a grad student on Zoom or webcast, I don't know if I'll definitely be able to get you in, but I will uh, try. I've opened the conversation, but there are significant logistical hurdles. Now, if you want to sign up for a section or lab, see, oh, a to-do for me. You don't have to do anything. Like, uh, not doing signups. Thank you, Ethan. All right. Go to any section or lab you want. All right. Thank you for letting me know. Sorry, I missed that comment earlier. If you have an administrative, administrative issue, like uh, I need to drop the class or, and I need you to sign something, or like, do I need to do, do I need to go to section tomorrow or whatever? Um, make sure to post on Ed or send an email to this address. Uh, I'm happy to take emails about anything, of course, but an email that is like, hey, I'm not sure what to do, but blah, blah. there's a good chance that I'm going to just scroll past it because I get a million emails a day or not that many, but like a couple hundred a day. So uh, if you work at the math, if all of you sent me an email that took one minute, it would take me 20 hours to respond, uh, which is a lot. So admin issues sent to this address. Many of us look at it at the same time. Uh, but yeah, feel free to always email me like, hey, I saw something cool. I think you should know about it. Those emails are great. Uh, the ones where it's something else, something that someone else can do though, send to, send to that other person. In terms of the structure, I call this the 4.1 version of the class. So I'm always evolving this class. I did a pretty big revision last spring. I'm pretty happy with the, the version we've got. And it's basically in three phases. The first phase is an intro to Java. We have four weeks of this as 11 lectures. There's a couple of homeworks. The first homework is optional and it's a browser-based programming homework. And then homework one is an interesting bit of an experiment that was introduced last year by some of the TAs. And I read all the feedback, it was very positive. Uh, and it's all about being a good member of the community that is our class, right? So we wanna be able to form good partnerships and be welcoming to each other. And you know, it's funny because if you look on like, uh, College Confidential or Reddit or whatever, you'll see people always saying this thing about Berkeley being cutthroat. And it's strange because it's not that Berkeley is cutthroat at all. I feel like it's extremely collaborative. It's just hard because we're trying to really push the limits of what you know. Um, and so this homework is basically here to ensure that we're just, we have good, a good vibe. That's what this is the homework is about. So we have good vibes. Uh, we also have four labs and the labs during these first four weeks are gonna be, here's how you use Git. Here's how you use IntelliJ. Here's how you use the debugger. Here's how you use Git again. Uh, and so we'll start that this week. And um, those labs are yeah, very tool-based. We're gonna have a couple of projects. Project Zero, I don't need the due dates here. I'm gonna delete that. Uh, There's Project Zero and One. I'll talk about what those are later. And there'll be a midterm. The midterm is actually gonna come pretty early and it's supposed to give you an early signal. So you know how you're doing. Uh, this midterm, back in the day, before they changed the rules, we used to get it out early enough that you could actually drop the class based on your grade. Unfortunately, they've moved the drop deadline so early that's no longer possible. But we do have it there as an early signal, and it's going to cover everything through Lecture 7, which is also going to cover up through half of Project 1. So that's the first part. So after you've learned the basics, basics of Java, now comes all of those link coding type things all those job interview questions. This is your hash tables, your binary search trees, your heaps, all that sort of thing. This is the important foundational data structures material you'll have anywhere. And I have a slightly different take on how I teach it. I tend to invent it in class together. That's how I use the lecture time. And I hope you find that way of learning it fun. So we're gonna actually invent the data structures together. And the basic idea to me is these are the most interesting, or some, sorry, some of the earliest challenges posed to computer scientists. And I posed the question, you know, like how, how do we store data for easy retrieval by key, whatever that means. And then we work on it together and come up with a solution. And in that process, we learn how to solve any problem by solving the first problems. We're gonna have one programming homework and one theory homework at this part. And that's gonna give you some deeper insight into all those data structures. The theory homework was the new thing from uh, 61B 4.0. And then we're gonna have one large solo data structures project. It's a new project that I put together this semester. In the past, we had a project called, last year and a half or so, there's been a project called Gitlet, which isn't really a data structures project exactly. So I created a new one that's more data structures-y. Uh, I'll talk about it later. Another day, that is. Uh, and then in terms of labs, there's going to be one peer review lab, at least two labs where you implement some data structure, and maybe a third still in the works. And then we're also going to have uh, project two. And there'll also be a midterm. 
And then lastly, phase three is the part where I'm going to slow our pace a little bit because we're all tired and it's the end of the semester. So in this part, weeks 10 through 14, we're going to have a mix of algorithms. So things like quick sort or merge sort, that sort of thing. But we're also going to talk philosophically about the ideas behind software engineering. So how do you organize software? Uh, so those lectures aren't really testable. So that's great for you. You can come to lecture, kind of sit back, relax, absorb some uh, good lessons. And also we're just gonna have one project, which is a big open-ended super fun project called Build Your Own World. And the labs in that case will be devoted entirely to the project. So I generally, the way I think about it is I front load the class. It's, it starts off super fast, will eventually slow down uh, to some degree. All right. Now in terms of labs and discussion, attendance for labs and discussion is not required. Uh, this is uh, old and Dutch, uh, geez. You know, I went through all the slides, but just like there's things I don't even see. I'm so excited about picking the right music to play before class, before remembering, wait, there's 500 people in the room, so no one's gonna actually be able to hear anything, so don't bother. Uh, but uh, in terms of labs, um, so labs will be due Fridays at 11.59 p.m. Things are all in person this semester. There will be an online section in an online lab. We'll send out information for those of you who are interested, but the default assumption is that things are in person this semester. Um, it's possible for the labs to get full credit without finishing the entire lab, and there'll be an auto grader and you'll be able to figure that out, right? So the auto grader determines your points on the labs and the homeworks and the projects. So if you're getting all the points on the auto grader, then you're getting all the points. In terms of collaboration, okay. So you have to submit your own solution to all the homeworks, labs, and projects with the exception that for project three, you have to have a partner. Okay. And there's an exception to that, which is if you really, really, really have to work on your own for some reason, we can accommodate, but... By default, 99% of you are going to do project three with a partner. Okay. Now, the reason that we're having you do all this stuff solo is I really want you to build the foundational skills so that you can do all this great programming as you move forward. But I do want you at one point in this class to have a chance to have a really collaborative experience, and that's where project three comes from. Now, it's okay to talk to each other. I don't care if you guys get together and whiteboard out possible solutions to problems or that sort of thing. What I don't want you to do is to panic because a deadline's coming, then ask someone to send you their code. Then you look at it and write basically the same code with slightly different variable names and maybe like slightly different orderings of things because you're, you're looking at their code and using it as direct inspiration. One, you're missing the entire point of the assignment. And two, it's plagiarism, so don't do that. Uh, so common mistakes we see people fall into pitfalls is looking at someone else's code for tips. Like I need just some like idea of where I'm going. Not a good idea. And another is having someone sit down with you and helping you debug, but then they end up just sort of like writing a program for you effectively. So those two directions often result in over collaboration. We have a pretty verbose collaboration policy that good news, in order to get your account, you have to fill out a syllabus quiz or you answer questions about this. And so I just say fundamentally, the most important thing is your work should be yours alone and that you should cite your sources. And yes, that's a little blurry. And for those of you who have a hard time navigating these sort of ambiguous situations, it is hard. So feel free to come ask. But we've left the line blurry on purpose. I mean, that's life. You know, the boundary between collaboration and over collaboration is a blurry thing. We want you to always be learning, but we don't want you to struggle un unnecessarily. So if you need help navigating this, let us know uh, and we'll be friends. All right. So you will have to know the policies and you'll have to answer some quizzes about it, but I'm not going to belabor it during lecture. Okay, almost done with logistics. So there's a weekly survey due every Monday. Uh, the idea here is I like having systems with feedback in them. I like to know how things are going. So we're gonna be checking in on your progress. We're going to have you guys report your attendance on things so that we know who's going to what. Uh, it allows us to tweak the course and it allows us to hopefully notice people who are having a hard time so we can reach out. Uh, these are free points in the sense that it doesn't matter what you put on the survey. And it doesn't take that long. We're not gonna allow late submissions, but we're gonna drop four because, hey, people forget to submit the thing on Mondays. There's a thing also called a study guide where on the website, you'll see there's always a video link to the slides and a guide. And the guide's gonna give a brief summary of the lecture. Uh, we also will have problems of varying difficulty that you can use to study. And the hardest problems I should note will be really hard and you don't have to do these all. They're not even a way to submit them, nor will we really submit solutions because we don't wanna write them. Uh, but the hardest problems will be tough enough that they'll give the TAs and even me a hard time. So be nice to your TAs if you go and give them the hardest guide problem. I expect the very hardest problems are hard for them too. 
Uh, the study guide also includes a check-in exercise. So after a lecture, some people like to have a checkpoint to know like, did I really give the basics? Uh, and so there's no credit for those, but it's useful. Let me demo that since I've been talking without context for some time here. Oh, wrong, that's E. That's, uh, why am I, why did I have that blocked up? Okay, uh, spring, whatever. Spring 22 data structure. Why is my browser remembering EE? Okay, whatever, okay, I'm gonna find our website. I said whatever twice, or sorry, three times in one minute. Spring 22, brain malfunctioning. I do some math problems, wake up. Okay, why can't I find our website? Why would I come? Oh. <laughs> That's funny. It's the ball. You could fool me though. Oh boy. All right. That's funny. I was really struggling there. Yeah, that guide's done. Or let's go back to spring 21. <laughs> the guides are not. Okay. So this is what a guide looks like. Uh, here's a link to the code for the lecture. Here was a thing called a live QA, which is defunct now because we're not. This is what I did instead of lectures during the Zoom days. Um, and this is a check in exercise. Back in spring 21, uh, not myself though, so I have to open this. Let me just give you a flavor for one of these things. So it basically says, why might we make the nested int node class private, right? So if you can answer these questions, then you get a sense of accomplishment, but we're not grading them. Overview of the lecture, some exercises. All right, cool. Okay, just a tiny bit more. Exams. So exams are gonna be in person with some rare exceptions, or with some remote exceptions. We'll get to that later when the exams get closer. Exams will be in Pacific time. Uh, it's closed note, except you can bring cheat sheets and again, tell you later. Exams will have medians around the 60% range and I'll justify that decision later. Um, and if you do better on the final than your early exams, then you can replace your early scores. So in other words, if you show improvement or you just have a bad day on one of your midterms, there is a way out. Website explains how it works. We got three midterm times here uh, listed. And we will accommodate conflict, uh, conflicts with other exams or those of you who really need to take an exam remotely. And it is a valid thing to say, I just wanna take the exam remotely because I don't wanna be in a room full of people. That's fine. That's still totally okay. Um, exactly how, exactly the rules by which we will allow alternate exams is yet to be determined, but we'll definitely allow people who have a direct conflict to take it at different times. And we'll definitely allow people to take it remotely who are concerned about being in a room full of people. In terms of points, here's a point breakdown. I refuse to read it because it's a bunch of numbers, uh, but this is where all the points come from. Now, the grades in this class are not curved. They're, they're not based on your relative performance. Uh, and in past semesters, the grade cutoffs I put on the website, I just use them. Sometimes I tweak just a little bit um, and I'll put the grading bins up. I haven't picked the values yet, but I will by week three. I just have to do an analysis based on spring 21. All right, last thing. Uh, there's no late work accepted in the class, but, and there's no homeworks, labs, or project drops, but we do have slip days. Okay. Now the slip day system is a little complicated. You get nine slip days. You can use up to four per assignment. And if you run out of slip days or you need to make an exception to these policies, you can reach out to us. So the deadlines you should treat seriously with some slip. And if the slip is still not enough, let us know and we can work with you. Okay. Now, this class, we are pretty flexible. Nine slip days is a lot. And the ability to just come talk to us and say, hey, I need a little more time is something you should not expect in other classes. I say here that 61B is not as strongly cumulative. And what I mean by that is that if you fall behind on the stuff we're doing in week six, it's possible to still know what's happening in week eight because the class isn't just exactly like a, like a giant stack of knowledge. It's more of a broader thing. And so if you go onto a class like say CS70 or 16A, this type of policy would not make any sense, but we can at least do it. So it's not uncommon, or sorry, it's not totally unheard of that somebody ends up having to do some part of the class much later because they had some life crisis. We try to be as flexible as we can without letting you fall into being procrastinating. All right, my last logistics slide, and then we'll do some programming. So we're gonna start off this class really fast. There's already a homework zero out. It's intro to Java syntax, and it'll take one to four hours, and you can work with friends. Now it's totally optional, but I still recommend you do it. And I'd really recommend you do it by lecture Friday. Uh, lab one's also up, it's in two parts. One is how to get your computer set up for the class. And the other is how to use some tools. And then project zero will be out Friday and it'll be due the following Friday. 
And I'd say, hey, if you can start this Saturday, cool. Uh, especially if you're new to Java, uh, it's going to allow you to use basic Java features and solve a little algorithmic problem. 